for just a moment. We've spent a lot of time on a lot of stuff this morning. I had to preach Sunday school this morning. And it, listen, my OCD is so bad that anything that is different in a day messes my day. I, here's the thing. When I get my hands on Brother Mark, I'm going to kill him because he has totally blown my day. I mean, the entire day, Brother Jeff is shot. Nothing today is right in my head. I'm all messed up because I had to teach Sunday school this morning. I'm not used to that, and that's it. The day is blown. I mean, I'm thinking, I, I got to preach. Where am I at? What's going on? I, my, my daily ritual, everything is different. What's, where am I? I'm telling you, and it won't go away until I get up tomorrow morning and try to start a whole new day. So you see, that's what happens to me. It's just, <laughs> I have a nervous breakdown about things, all right? No, I, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to teach and preach, and we did have a good time in Sunday school this morning. And uh, if you missed it, you did. And it wasn't because of me. Uh, I was all over the place, but we did, we did try to enjoy ourselves. But uh, 1 Peter chapter number 4, please look with me at verse number 12, beloved. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy if you be reproached for the name of Christ. Happy are ye, for the spirit uh, of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their party is evil spoken of, but on your party is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come... That judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. Let's pray, Father. Help us this morning. Lord, uh, use me as a vessel, and I pray that, Lord, I empty myself of, of myself. And I, I'm in the way right now. I, I even know that. I sense that about myself. And I want to get out of the way and let you stand in, in my stead this morning. And, and, and Lord, deliver the message and help me to stay true to the text of the Word of God. And help me to help your people this morning. Uh, Lord, I know the weather it may, may have made us a little bit uh, lethargic this morning. And it seems like it's been several days since we've had uh, a good stretch of sunlight. And that plays on people. And uh, I understand all of those things, but Lord, remove the distractions and help the sunlight to shine in our souls. Help the Son of God to be very real and very evident in this room. Have the preeminence in the service. We thank you for the opportunity to minister uh, on behalf of thee and to preach this morning the precious Word of God yet one more time. Help us to do it in a way that if you were standing here or sitting in this audience, you would be pleased with the way that we've delivered your Word. And then stir the hearts uh, of the saints of God. Help us to be ready and prepared for the day of thy return. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ and for his sake, amen and amen. You may be seated this morning. Last week, uh, we looked at, uh, we were looking at uh, verse number 15 and we were looking uh, in verse number, uh, well, we looked at verse number 14 and verse number 15. Uh, we looked at the pleasure of uh, we looked at the prohibiting of verse number 15 last Sunday night. Uh, if you suffer, you ought to suffer uh, as a Christian for spiritual reasons. And that was what Paul, or I'm sorry, that was what Peter was saying. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody. But here's what he's going to say in verse number 16. He's going to give us in verse number 16 our posture. Our posture. What should the believer do? Look at verse number 16. Yet if any man suffer, all right? Now he's not going to stop there. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. What is our posture? If we suffer for the cause of Christ, if it comes down to the place in our life where we will uh, have to suffer, and I'm not talking about a physical malady in your body or something that you suffer with, but... If we can make, as we learned in Sunday school, a practical application of Scripture, what if you did have to suffer with something uh, in your physical body uh, as a Christian? What should we do? Should we be ashamed of that? 
Should we be ashamed of that thing that the Lord has given to us? Uh, the Apostle Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not talking, uh, he was talking spiritual, but he was also talking physical as a man who was persecuted for the cause of Christ. And he said, I am not ashamed of those things. I'm jumping ahead of myself in the sermon. But he said, I am, I'm proud to bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here we see in the scripture, what should the believer do? Number one, in the A part of verse number 16, I want you to see apologetic. Apologetic. Should we be apologetic? Oh, I'm sorry. Should we say that? Do you know that persecution, the, the root cause or the root uh, thing that persecution tries to do is tries to get you apologetic. Do you know that? What do they want you to do if they persecute you as a Christian? They want you to stop. They want you to say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm this. Oh, I'm that. But wait a minute now. I mean, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed of the fact that he's suffering as a Christian. And the root cause or the, 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 the goal uh, of persecution, it tries to shame you. It tries to belittle you in front of others, doesn't it? It tries to intimidate you. Uh, it tries to get the believer to be ashamed and therefore cause you to quit and therefore cause you to compromise and therefore cause you to back down and therefore cause... I mean, what is the devil is the accuser of the brethren and when God lays something on your heart that he wants you to do, isn't it the devil that comes along, tries to shame you and belittle you and say they don't want that or they're not interested in that? And do you know what that causes? It causes you to be ashamed. Well, I'd be bothering them or I'd be this or I'd be that. But yet when the world wants to peddle something to you and I, they don't care whether or not they bother you with the garbage they want to peddle, do they? They don't care. But yet we're apologetic when it comes to the things of Christ. I better keep my Christianity hidden. Hey, young people in public school, don't keep your Christianity hidden. I don't stinking care if they tell you you can pray or not. You can pray any way that you want to. It's your God-given right. You say, well, uh, they told us that we can't. Give them my phone number. I'll gladly talk to them about your God-given right to pray anywhere that you want to. They cannot take that away from you. Oh, you may not be able to stand up and publicly pray, but I'd do that until they told me not to. I'd have a prayer service in school until they told me not to. And then when they told me not to, I'd call the news and my pastor and a few other people. But listen, don't be ashamed to bow your head and pray uh, at the lunch table with the other kids around. Don't be ashamed. It's all right. Hey, I'm like you. And sometimes I feel ashamed when I'm sitting in a restaurant and everybody's staring at me and I bow my head and pray. You do, preacher? Everybody's looking at you like, mm-hmm. What are they doing? And you know what it caused you to do? Well, I can pray. How many of you believe you can pray without bowing your head? How many of you believe you can pray without closing your eyes? I mean, you, you can pray without bowing your knee. You can pray. I can talk to God as well as I'm talking to you. Just like this, just talk to Him. And so I could just sit there and say, Lord, I'm about to shovel this in my face. And I could say it real quietly, like, Lord, I'm about to shovel this in my face. I just pray you bless me and everything will be all right. But you know what? Sometimes it's all right. Just hush the crowd around you and just bow your head. People will get quiet. It does get pretty interesting when you do that in some places. I mean, you'd be in a noisy restaurant or something like that, and all of a sudden, man, maybe you're with a group of people, and all of a sudden someone's got to pray, and they got to pray loud enough so people can hear them, and so they pray, and all of a sudden, you ever notice how everything goes, and they're like, oh boy, we got the Jesus freaks on the scene over there. But we ought not to be apologetic for that. You want to know why? Because I'll sit in that same stinking restaurant and listen to the jerk at the table next to me use filthy language when my children are sitting there and he don't stinking care about that. Right? Telling jokes and doing this and drinking alcohol and carrying on and I'm sitting there. He ain't ashamed of doing any of that. We ought to not be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ because the message that we have is far more important than the message that they have which is live for yourself. So, Persecution tries to shame, belittle, intimidate. Uh, and, and then when that happens in my life, and maybe you're not like me, but it will cause me to quit. And if it doesn't cause me to quit, Brother Caston, this one thing is sure, and we have seen it in society, and we've seen it in the church age, it causes us to compromise. People don't like the old-fashioned preacher anymore. I mean, people don't like the preacher that, that wears a suit and tie. The neck noose. I like wearing a tie. 
Business professionals wear ties too. It's a professional job. It's just a professional thing. You know, we used to live in a society. I mean, you ever watch Leave it to Beaver? Dad wore a jacket and a tie to the dinner table and never came any other way to the dinner table. Word cleaver. <laughs> I like Leave it to Beaver. <laughs> that beaver is one dumb kid. And why him and his brother have got the dumbest friends in the world. I mean, you think a parent would be a little bit smarter than that. And say, like, you know, stop hanging around him, Wally. I mean, it's just bad news, man. And Beaver, what is with these friends getting you in trouble all the time? Kick them to the curb and get some good friends. Uh, anyways, I've gone to preaching about Beaver Cleaver. But there was a time in our society we did that. Now we got a pastor who gets in the pulpit wearing a pair of blue jeans, untucked, shirt un unbuttoned, down to here, showing off his gold chain, doing this and doing that, and preaching the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because that's how he would have done it. You're stuck on stupid if that's what you think. You say, well, he probably wouldn't have wore a suit and tie. He might not have, but he definitely wouldn't have looked like that either. Amen. Like he just stepped out of a, I don't even know what. And I'm all for looking sharp any other time you want to wear a pair of blue jeans and a jacket and, and go out to, I mean, do whatever you, I, I, I'm just talking about this level of professionalism. And you don't want to know why, though? Here's where I was going with that, but the cast is compromise. Well, that old-fashioned music, you know, if I just changed the music a little bit, I could not just fill this pew with young people, but I could fill every pew with young people, and you old people could just go find somebody that could preach to you the way that you like it. There's a few, of, there's a few churches around for old people. Because that is what most old-fashioned, Bible-believing, hellfire and brimstone Baptist or Bible or any other type of churches are anymore. You say, how do you know that? Because I got a lot of friends that are preachers, and I go to their churches, and I look at their congregations, and they're not full of babies. They're not full of young people. They're not full of teenagers. They're full of an elderly crowd that is slowly beginning to die off because nobody really wants that anymore. And so we compromise because we're apologetic about the message that we preach. I'm not going to apologize for who I am, for being old. I'm not going to apologize for that. Hey, listen, I change things and we'll work things and we'll do this. Hey, I'm not against having a screen. I'm not against putting a song on the screen every once in a while. Give me a stinking break. I'm not against any of that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm all for moving forward with some things. But what I'm saying is, is there's a difference between changing and doing some things and compromising. And when we become apologetic, we'll begin to compromise. We will. And all of a sudden, then it's Christian rock. When I was a kid, there wasn't any such thing as Christian rock. Yeah, well, I, I, you're right. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Hawk. Would you like to preach the message, sir? I mean, I can go back and sit there. I can sit next to my wife if you'd like to get up and preach. <laughs> Don't be sorry, brother. Amen, Brother Hawk. That's good preaching, brother. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Why are you being apologetic right now? Man, Sunday, see, I told you I was messed up this morning. I told you I was messed up. It's like the Sunday school hour. I didn't ask for any input. No, I'm just kidding. He's right. There is no, still no such thing. Christian rap artists and this, that, and the other thing and all the other junk that's out there. And here's why. Because we've become apologetic, it doesn't mean that we're crazy. It doesn't mean that we're in your face type. Of, I mean, man, it's my way or the highway. Sometimes we do do that. Uh, but what I'm getting at is that when we begin to become apologetic, we will begin to compromise. And wait a second. Peter said, if you suffer, don't be ashamed. If people don't, if people don't want to come because you guys sing the hymns, and if people don't want to listen to the King James Bible being preached, and if people don't want, well, that, he said, don't be ashamed of that. I mean, that is a form of suffering, is it not? As we learned in, the, in a couple of verses back, uh, when he uh, used the wording there of reproached, making fun of and mocking uh, the one. And so here's the thing, and I kind of said this just a minute ago. Here's the thing. We don't We'll, what we'll do, we'll quit, we'll compromise, or we'll just be silent. Now, that's the other side of that, Brother Jeff. I just won't say anything. I'll just be the silent majority. And it's the silent majority is the reason why that these young people are not reading the Bible in school. 
It's the silent majority is the reason why these young people are not allowed to pray publicly or have a Bible study or something in school. It's the silent majority that has sat idly by and allowed absolutely horrific teaching to enter in, and they're teaching our young people all kinds of things that are contrary to the Word of God. And it's the silent majority, and that's why, because we become apologetic. Well, there's not really much that we can do about that. There's not. To some degree, we may not change it, Brother Caston, but by the grace of God, people will know where we stand on it. In other words, we won't be silent on the issue. So we may be in the minority, but we won't be silent on the issue. We still believe in one man for one woman. I don't care what they teach them in school. It's one man for one woman. God created Adam. God created Eve. It was biblical. It was God's idea. It wasn't my idea. It wasn't your idea. It was God's idea. Well, I don't like it. Then take it up with the great creator. But it is the way that he created it. Oh, well, you're, that's hate speech. I don't hate anybody. Who in the world do I hate? I've never said I hated them. I know some that live a homosexual lifestyle, and I love them. I pray for their salvation if they're not saved, or I pray for them to get right if they're not uh, right with God. You say, you can live in that lifestyle and not be right with God? Sure. I, I believe you probably could do that just as well as you could live in any lifestyle and not be right with God. Let's be careful who we throw stones at. But that just because I say I love them and, and I'm for them and, and we're going to love them and we're not going to pick it and we're not going to do anything and if they want to have a parade in Whitmore Lake and we're not going to stand for it and we're going to stand against it but we're not going to go down there and make idiots out of ourselves either. There is a vast difference in some of that stuff. But we are also not going to take a back seat and say, well, we're going to just we'll go ahead and march with them. We won't. We're not apologetic for the things that we stand for. And we're not going to be silent, and we've been silent for a very long time. And we're getting overrun. I don't know if you were listening to it, but if you listened to the president's speech, as I mentioned earlier, in case you didn't hear what he said, he said, we're trying to make a world where Muslims can worship freely. Did he say it, brother? He said it. Never said one thing about Christians. You heard him say it too. And when he said it, I went, Eh? Are you against Muslims worshiping freely? No, I am not. But why don't you throw Christians in there? Why don't you throw every other religion in there too? What are you, 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 are you kidding me? Why? Because if he said something about Christians, man, everybody would be up in arms, wouldn't they? Oh, you're supporting Christians. But we say something about some other religious group? Nobody does anything. messed up and I'm for the worship you listen you worship any stinking body you want to because the freedom that gives you the the right to worship whoever you want to gives me the right to worship the one and true and only God the thrice holy God that sits in the heavens that one day is going to knock your God slap out Amen. but that don't matter see I'm all for worship for everybody man do whatever you want worship your stinking car I don't care I care biblically. What I'm saying is it's about freedom. It's about freedom. And when we become silent, guess what happens? We lose our freedom. We lose our freedom. And you know who loses their freedom first? Christians. We get things start taken away from us. A little of this and a little of that, and you guys are dogmatic, and you guys are this, and... And, you know, they start the finger pointing at all of us. Hey, I am a regular person like everybody else. I just love God. I just want to serve him. I want to tell others about him. If you're not interested in hearing it, that's fine with me. I'll move on to somebody else that is. Hey, I like the rights that I have in America, the right to bear arms, which was given to me by my forefathers. I appreciate it. The right to pray, the right to worship, the right to assemble, the right to have the word of God. I like all of those rights just as well as anybody else likes the rights that they have. But when we sit by and become apologetic, we will systematically lose those rights. And the people they go after first are the crazy Christians. 
Now, there's a few of you in this room that you do worry me a little bit, but I think for the most part, we're all pretty normal. I don't think anybody in here is in the militia. We're all just normal. <laughs> I'm going to keep moving on that one because some of you didn't say amen. You scare me a little bit. So we don't have to be belligerent, but we don't have to take the back seat. Look in uh, Isaiah chapter number 50. Isaiah chapter number 50. A couple places here in the scripture, and then I'm going huh, to have to be done. Isaiah chapter number 50. Brother, brother Eric, would you just slip out and hit that fan? Just give me a little bit of air circulation. It's not cold. It's not warm, but it's stuffy. Uh, Isaiah chapter number 50, and you don't have to turn them on high. Ladies won't like me if you do that. Uh, Isaiah 50, and look at verse number 7. For the Lord God will help me. Now, it's talking about Jesus Christ, by the way, prophetically. For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. That's talking about Jesus Christ. If you read the verses before that, he says he's going to give his back to the smiters, Brother Caston. People are going to spit on him. People are going to make fun of him. But he says, God's going to help me, and I'm going to set my face like a flint. And he says, as long as I'm moving towards that goal, that's eh, a little bit, just a little bit more. As long as I'm moving towards that goal, he says, I'm not going to be ashamed of it when I do it. Uh, fast forward uh, in the scripture, uh, and, I, and I hit this a little bit earlier, Philippians chapter number 1, the Apostle Paul. Philippians chapter number 1. You're turning, I'm going to read Philippians 1 and verse number 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. He said, how much did he say that he would be ashamed about when it came to the things of Christ? He said nothing. The Apostle Paul uh, would say in other parts, and we don't have time to turn to all of them, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and his salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He said, I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel. And anything that I do for God, I won't be ashamed of it because it was done for the cause of Christ. And the Apostle Paul would say, and that I, made ha that I will use all boldness. He says, I'm not going to back down or take a back seat either. I'm going to stand my ground. And so you see there, there is the apologetic part of it. And then in the latter part, go back to our text, there is the adoration part of it. There is the adoration. Let him not be ashamed, but here's what it says, but let him glorify God on this behalf. There is adoration. Do you know the interesting thing that that verse teaches you? Is that the, thing that the one thing that persecution tries to stop is the one thing that it accomplishes? more than any other thing. It's the glorification of God. They don't want us to glorify God, so we'll kill all the Christians. That's what persecution said. Persecution said, you're not serving our God, so we're going to kill you, Brother Rady. It, it, it doesn't have anything to do with whether or not we believe that your God is right. You're just not serving what we told you that you could serve, so we're going to persecute you. And so then they do that. And the one thing that they try to do is the one thing that works in reverse. God is so good like that because any time that you would find the church persecuted or God's people persecuted is when God's people thrive. Now, I don't understand all of that, but I know that in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, and the church at Jerusalem was well above 100,000 members. And we thought we had the largest Sunday school in Hammond, Indiana back in the 70s, Brother Caston, because they ran 20,000. The church at Jerusalem, after the Lord Jesus Christ has ascended, that the disciples, the apostles, stayed there and preached, 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 and the word of Christ went forth. And, and, and above, they say, in the, in the range of 100,000, it could have been more than that, membership on the rolls, people that were saved, baptized believers of that church. What a man, what a church. But here's the thing, they hadn't done anything else. In Acts, and that's Acts 1 and verse number 8, you would find that God gives them the commission 
to go, right, into all the world. Jesus Christ gives them the commission to go in Acts 1 and verse number 8. And you flip those two numbers around, and in Acts 8 and verse number 1, the Bible says that when persecution came to the church at Jerusalem, they were spread abroad and took the gospel to the world, and the gospel went forth, and the cause of Christ and churches were established all over the globe. Now, wait a minute. Persecution arose. Shouldn't they have all, shouldn't have, the church, if it was running 100,000, 200,000, 80,000, whatever it was, that the, shouldn't they all gone into hiding? No, they said, we're just going to find another place to go. We'll find somewhere where we're received. Now, did some die in the persecution? Well, absolutely, because how else will we know that persecution came to the church? Look at the Apostle Paul. It says he went, into, he went into churches and into houses and hailed them and drug some off to prison, and that's what he was on his way to do uh, there uh, in Damascus. He had been doing that up to that point. He wasn't the only one working for the Roman government, okay? They all hated Christianity. And so how many, how many Christians died through that persecution? I don't have any idea, but I know this. That persecution may have come, but they didn't get ashamed. The apostles said, if I can't do it in Jerusalem, Brother Al, I'm going to do it over here. I'll go to Antioch. Persecution hasn't reached Antioch yet. Now, it was going to reach there, and it was going to reach some of the other regions, but the Apostle Paul would go to Asia, and Europe would get the gospel, and uh, all the parts of the globe, in my estimation, would get the gospel. Why? Because that's what Jesus told the disciples to do, and I believe that the disciples did exactly what Christ told them to do, and that was go into all the world and preach the gospel. They couldn't do it themselves, but they taught and trained others. And what do you think the Ethiopian eunuch did? He didn't just get saved and go back into his country and shut his mouth. He went back into his country where nobody else had gone yet and he preached the gospel and started a, a, a revival and they say that literally if you trace history you would find that literally dozens upon dozens upon dozens of churches were established because of one man that took the gospel and so it can get done and God's cause goes forth but God's cause goes forth uh, under persecution why they try to stop it, and God says, all that does is points more to me. It just shows that I am the one true God. And then people look at that, and they go, how can they go through all that they're going through and still keep their eyes on their Creator and love Him and serve Him? And they don't back down, and they don't back up, and they get in prison, and they get uh, burned at the stake and all the other things, and yet the whole time they're just they're like Stephen, and they're saying, lay not this sin to their charge. How can they do that? And through their testimony, they point people to Christ. And the church in China today, the underground church that you and I don't even know about, and the numbers they think are very conservative, very conservative because they really don't have any idea, but they estimate 10,000 people a day come to Jesus Christ in communist China where they could never meet like this. They could never have an assembly. They could never do any of this. 10,000 a day, conservative numbers, because they have no idea. Now, how can that be in a persecuted country? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And what the devil has always tried to thwart and what he has always tried to stop, God just comes through and he shows the devil that he is better. And he's going to do it in the end too, by the way. He's going to do it in the end when he casts him into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And he's going to get what he's got coming to him. And now until that time, we're sort of in the nasty now and now, aren't we? What are we going to do about all that? Not really being persecuted like some are. I mean, we're doing pretty good. I'll tell you this. But we're also very ashamed. We're ashamed. And I know because I know the way that I am. And I'm ashamed of myself for being ashamed of him when he was never ashamed of me because he set his face like a flint and went all the way to the cross of Calvary for me when I didn't even deserve it. Never once was he shamed. And I did not deserve it. And neither did you. And so we have opportunity to speak on behalf of Christ. And yeah, we live in a hard world. My word. I never thought I'd come to the day, Brother Castro, and I would say how much the world has changed. But I guess we're old guys now, and we talk about how much the world has changed since we were kids. I mean, we remember going soul winning with our parents and grandparents. And it was easy. Relatively. You know, we're not interested. Man, it was easy to fill a bus up with kids. And now it's, it's, like, it's like pulling teeth. 
I know it doesn't seem like anybody and how quickly things are changing. But yeah, here's the thing. We're still not under that great of persecution, and yet we're ashamed. We're ashamed to let the people at work know we're a Christian. Why? They're not ashamed to tell you what they did on Friday night with their paycheck. I mean, in graphic detail. They're not ashamed. Because we live in a world that's not ashamed about anything except Jesus Christ. We got a lot of Christians hiding out. It's time to, time for us to come out of the closet of Christianity and let the world know, hey, we're here. Calvary Baptist Church is still independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, man. We hate sin. We preach against hell. We live and stand for the right kinds of things, still use the King James Bible, still sing from a church hymnal. Well, we don't like it. Well, good. There are churches within five minutes of here in every single direction. I'll give you the address, give you the phone number, give you the name, give you the pastor, give you everything else that you need so that you can go there and you can do whatever kind of hokey po they got going on on Sunday or any other day of the week that they worship. But I'll tell you that that's what we got going on here, and I'm not ashamed of it. I like it. I just, I, yeah, thank you. Amen, sis. I love it too. I've, I've always liked being in the minority. We moved, around, we moved around when I was a kid. Never really had a lot of friends. Don't really have a lot of friends now. I'm good with that. You get used to it. I'm not being belligerent, but I don't really need friends. That Bible never tells me make friends. I got a friend that's thicker closer than a brother. I got a few friends. I got some guys that are like-minded. I'm going to hang around them, man. The rest of the yokels, hey. Eh. So persecution tries to stop some things, but that thing is accomplished through the thing of persecution. I'm done. It is time for Christians to be what we should be. Why? I, I think I just heard some place settings being put on a table. Is that silverware? Oh, the silverware's already down. Okay. Man, I don't know what they're cooking up there, but I just got a whiff of it, and Brother Al smells pretty good. And the dinger, the timer, the timer, the dinger. I don't know why I called it that, Brother John. The timer is about ready to tick off, and the oven's going to be done. What's in it? And that food's going to come out of the oven hot and fresh and get set on the table right about the time that the trump sounds. And we're out, reunited with our groom that's gone on ahead to prepare the place for us. And whither I go, you know, and the way, you know, because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so let's just be ready. Wait, how about giving out a gospel track when he comes back? Whoop! Well, that was their last chance. Think about it. We're so close. Let's live ready. Father, we love you.